Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Traders Summit. With me today, I have Michael Guyad. He's the publisher of the Lead Lag Report, and it's been a long time. Michael, thanks for joining us today. I always appreciate it, Blake. Yeah, you know, I, I want to say it's been it's been quite some time since we've had a discussion. And um, I, I did the one-on-one -on -one interview with you when we did a live trading event, and it was really cool. I, I learned a lot about what the Lead Lag Report was and what you did. And one of the th one of the things that you looked at and and you took a really really close look at was uh, lumber in relation to gold, and it gave you a lot of indication of what was happening underneath the surface, and I, that was before lumber just took off. And so I want I want to ask have you have you updated the way you look at things, or what are you looking at now that's moving the markets? Well, first of all, it's important to to always ask the question which markets, right? So I put yeah. out a tweet. Uh, the other day on my timeline on that lead lag report where I keep on hammering this narrative that it's been a, a bull market when in reality, since February, most things have not gone up. Yeah. Right. So if you were to look at things like NASDAQ breadth, you see that 29% of uh, the NASDAQ companies are above the 200 day moving average, despite the NASDAQ hitting all time highs. Yeah. And the reason that market's been hitting new all time highs, right. Is because it's being driven by just a select group of stocks that we all know the, the leadership has been, unbelievably narrow this year and has made, I would argue, 2021 one of the most treacherous and deceptive years for active traders you could possibly imagine. Because again, on the surface, everything looks fine and dandy, but the reality is a lot of things have not really participated on the upside. It's actually been quite challenging. So, so now let's go back to the signal. So it's important with every form of analysis to always keep in mind that there is no holy grail, that there will always be false signals. And it's okay to have false signals as long as the way you execute on the signal, which is false with only with hindsight, allows you the ability to be wrong, but still make money. So the lumber to gold relationship, which goes to the uh, 2015 Founders Award paper uh, as a sort of refreshing of memory, basically documents this idea that when lumber is doing well, generally stock market volatility tends to uh, fall uh, when gold is outperforming lumber that volatility in the stock market tends to rise afterwards with a lag. And the reason why lumber to gold is tell, it tells you about volatility dynamics is because of the link to housing, right? So as lumber performs, it would suggest that uh, home construction is going to pick up because the average home has about 16,000 board feet of lumber. Uh, if it's doing poorly, it would suggest that construction is going to drop and that would have all kinds of implications on credit creation going forward. And Factually, it's not my opinion. Every single major crash correction bear market has been preceded uh, by weakness in lumber relative to gold. So typically when lumber is outperforming gold, that's suggestive of an environment that favors lower volatility in the stock market afterwards. And when gold is outperforming lumber, you tend to see the opposite, higher risk, higher volatility dynamics. And it's not some random relationship as to why that occurs. The link is around housing. Right, so we know that uh, the average home has about 16,000 board feet of lumber. Uh, as lumber performs, there's all kinds of implications on what it suggests for growth, inflation, credit creation, so on and so forth. Uh, gold, on the other hand, is more of a, a safe haven, non-cyclical commodity. So when you compare lumber to gold, it actually tells you a lot about risk. And it's not my opinion. Factually, every single major crash correction bear market has been preceded by weakness in lumber relative to gold, right? So now that's not to say that every time that lumber is weak relative to gold, you have a crash or a bear market or recession. It's that when you have a crash, bear market or recession, lumber to gold tends to already be weak. Got and it. that kind of dovetails into the signal for this year because you've had lumber to gold surge and then it completely collapsed starting uh, late May into around July, as I recall. And on the surface, you'd say, well, you know, I thought this was meant this, the stock market was going to collapse. Saying the conditions for an accident are there is very different than making a call for a collapse. Sure. So with hindsight, right, you can say it was a false signal, meaning the warnings were there, but the market did not go down. But this goes back to this point about how you execute matters. If you short and your signal is wrong, you lose money one for one. You got to be spot on if you're shorting, because you're making a directional bet. If, however, your expression of risk off, like it is in my Rora and JoJo ETFs, is to go long duration treasuries, as an example, 
your signal could be wrong in that it's anticipating higher volatility for the stock market, but it doesn't come, but you can still make money, right? And this year is a very good example of that because treasury yields have kept on dropping ever since mid-March. Yeah. So you could have been wrong anticipating a big decline in stock, but you still could have made money being wrong because your opportunity set allowed you to. And I think that's something which I always uh, struggle to get people to, to, to think through, right? There's, there's this constant obsession with whether you're right or wrong. I don't care about being wrong as long as I'm making money when I'm wrong. Well, and you know, one of the other things, Michael, I just re- regarding exactly what you're talking about, you, you know, you have to take in other instances too, or reasons why uh, we got this big surge in lumber prices at that point in time. I mean, I, I think I think what you're saying here is there are different ways to skin a cat when you're in the markets, obviously. And then you also probably should take a look around and not blindly, you know, trade things too, right? Well, it depends. So like in, in my case, when you're rules based and following a signal that's, you know, around in the case of my funds, for example, right? Sure. You can't, you can't sort of editorialize any particular signal too much because the problem is the moment you do that, there's then a temptation to always overlay your thinking on the signal of the moment. Got it. So what happens is then is that your back tests fail because now you're putting this, this layer of you right on, on the decision-making process. Now, having said that, I think the way to think about any proven back-tested tactical signal or strategy is that every signal has its own idiosyncratic risks, right? Which are the whipsaw risks. So taking a step back, right? Yeah. When you go back to kind of investing one-on-one, every single individual stock has idiosyncratic risk, company-specific risk, which could be positive, could be negative, but is a risk, right? Because what causes gaps up and gaps down. Okay. So what does traditional finance say? If you want to get rid of that idiosyncratic risk in one stock, you have to diversify. You got to have multiple stocks with their own idiosyncratic risks, and they'll cancel each other out. Yeah. Okay. So the equivalent of diversification of, of rather idiosyncratic risk with tactical signals is the whipsaw risk, where lumber to gold is weak, and it's not a risk off period, or utilities are strong, and it's not a risk off period, or the yield curve is flattening, and it's not a risk off period. Well, how do you diversify away? How do, how do you resolve those idiosyncratic whipsaw risks with tactical signals by having multiple signals for portions of your portfolio that you're trading, which may be at odds to each other, right? But over time, will hopefully you know sync up when you need it the most. So my point is that you know it's like everybody again. I always go back to they always want to find the perfect signal, the thing that always is the the one favorite strategy. Uh, listen, if you there will be some signals, some strategies that work better in some environments than, than others. The, but because you don't know which cycle you're in, my, my suggestion is always to blend as many things that historically work as possible and simply you know, trust that over time, on average, it'll all work out. Yeah. So let, let me ask you this. And really, it's more of like diversifying into multiple assets, if you will, or different different venues just to make sure that you are you know, diversified, if you will. But but what are your indicators right now telling us in the current environment going into 2022? Because I think, you know, obviously, as you, as you mentioned early on, it has been a stock picker's market. It is a, definitely a more challenging uh, type of environment. So what are your signals actually showing you right now? So, you know, it's been a wildly frustrating year, again, because it's a tale of two very different markets. Right? Sure. You've got the very large mega cap, which is what's been driving the headline averages higher. And then you've got uh, US small caps, which have done nothing since February, just sideways, looking like classic distribution right. from a technical analysis perspective. So then you say to yourself, okay, well, then you go back to the signal. So as we speak, you know, this is you know, mid-December as we're doing this, uh, utilities are showing outperformance. Now, utilities are the most bond-like sector of the stock market. As I showed in the 2014 Dow Ward paper, utilities, just like lumber to gold, tend, tend to get ahead of major crashes, corrections, bear markets. Historically, when utilities are outperforming the stock market on a short-term basis, stock market volatility on average tends to rise. Why? Because utilities are defensive, because utilities are a play on interest rates. So demand for money falling, utilities outperform, cyclicals underperform, that tends to happen in advance of major declines. So we're seeing that. It's a very short term entering the end of the year here, right? The so-called Santa Claus rally looks more and more like it's not going to happen. Utilities are, are giving a warning sign. Now, against that backdrop, you've got a conflicting signal. Lumber to gold is strong, okay, which would suggest actually risk on. Yeah. Part of the strength in lumber to gold is because of idiosyncratic elements, 
which is to say that uh, the Biden administration doubled tariffs uh, on, on imports for softwood from Canada. So that's impacted the price of lumber and is making the ratio stronger than maybe it otherwise would be had it not been for that, that sort of one-off price readjustment on the tariff. Now, having said that, again, that's a good example of diversifying your risk signals. Historically, I mentioned when lumber to gold is weak, it tends to happen in advance of crashes, corrections, bear markets. Generally, in advance of crashes, corrections, and bear markets, all the signals I'm known for will give you the same message, meaning you would expect utility strong, risk off. At the same time, treasury strong, risk off. At the exact same time, lumber to gold weak, risk off. So they tend to correlate the same way because they're all about interest rates and defensive posturing at the end of the day. But in between is where there are differences. So it's a long-winded answer to say it's, it is a very confused environment. I do think that the odds overwhelmingly support that we're in a higher volatility environment than most realize. Yeah. Again, given the breadth, given defensive uh, areas, and honestly, given the narratives which are out there, it's like, you know, it's not just a function of, well, here's one index and who cares if it hasn't done well. You have to start, you have to really challenge these narratives. So uh, this whole bull market is predicated or was predicated on reflation and reopening and consumers. Well, if that's the case, then small caps should have outperformed large caps because small caps are more domestically sensitive than multinational large caps. Yeah. So uh, you've got the narrative on one hand, but then you've got the reality of price movement on the other saying something completely the opposite. Yeah. Right. So these divergences, they have a funny way of resolving themselves, usually violently. The question, of course, is how does it resolve itself? Meaning, will you see small caps play catch up to large caps? Will you see the areas which should have performed very well? Will you see that breadth improve because it's oversold because the number of stocks participating is so low? Or is this sort of the the what happened towards the you know late 99, early 2000, where you have this narrowing of leadership that then you know, precedes a real big pop, right? And the reality is you only know with hindsight, but you have to go the way to the evidence. I do think that there is a tremendous amount of complacency. And I think that the Fed really screwed itself uh, in the way they kept this this overreaction post-COVID in place. Yeah, so well, and we're going to find out, you know, later on this week, and 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 this is going to be after most of these viewers are watching um, this particular interview with you. Uh, we're going to find out this week just how accommodative uh, the Fed may or may not be, and and if they're going to actually pick up the pace of tapering, um, which most of the market is pricing in at this point. So, so being, you know, at at this stage though. What should if if I'm if I'm a Michael guy a guy uh, follower and I and I love to follow your work? What should I be trading right now? What should, you know any of the ETFs that are behind you right now that you're that you you've been discussing, or what what should I be looking at? So it's tricky, right? Because obviously it all depends on on time frame and and risk tolerance, as you know, right? So of like course. in the case of my Roro and Jojo ETFs, which I'm I'm running the rules based, they're very short term, so you know they can be risk on and then a week later be risk off and then back to risk on. And they can be whipped around very sensitive to the signals, which has its own risks, but often tends to also get ahead in a you know, kind of like in the nick of time of major drops. At least that's what the indices uh, they track uh, or attempt to track, try to do. Now, I do think that sometimes the hardest thing to do is to do nothing, right? So when you're in an environment like this, the question really becomes how much you want to really risk in the event that we may be towards a cycle turn. Yeah. Right. So, and and that's always extraordinarily tricky, right? And and the problem I think is, and this is this is sort of why I have such an issue with narratives and the media. The problem is that the media feeds into this FOMO, this fear of missing out, and naturally you want to feel like you're participating. You want to find the next thing which is going up vertically. You want to be with uh, all the all the Tesla nights, right? All the people that are betting on things which have gone uh, absolutely vertical. You got to be real careful with that. Right, because that's reporting the news, not the future. Right, and and you know, I think risk management is something which is very hard to for most people to get their head around until it's too late. So it's again a long-winded answer, but my argument would be that I think this is a much more treacherous environment than people realize. You've got a very big disconnect happening between this inflation narrative, between small caps doing nothing, between long-duration treasury yields dropping, suggesting that it's not going to be an inflationary future; it's actually going to be a deflationary future which, by the way, is actually a wildly disturbing concept, because if you take it to the logical extreme, if treasuries are correct, that would suggest that no amount of money printing is enough to create secular inflation, 
which means the Fed is really powerless. And there's all kinds of interesting implications. Yeah. If that's the case, right? But my point is that you're in an environment that's fraught with risk. The range of outcomes for future scenarios is very wide. So maybe the best thing to do from a trading and investing perspective is trade small and invest in a lot of different things that don't all bet on the same singular future, which most people are just extrapolating from the most recent past. All right. Well, where I'm going all along Bitcoin right now, then. So <laughs> hey, you know what? I mean, more value. You. I mean, I don't know if it's a store of value as I keep ranting about, but uh, listen, I mean, look, the, the here's the reality: concentration is how you become wealthy. Yeah. It's also, how you become broke. Right. So, and I think that's it's it's Nassim Taleb is is absolutely correct in that notion. I remember at a conference many many years ago, I forget who the person was, but the, the person said something along the lines of diversification is uh, a luxury for the rich. Because if you got to get rich, you got to take concentration risk. Yeah. That's also how you go poor, right? So right. again, nobody really thinks in those terms, but you got to always think about your risk tolerance and, and, and where we are in the cycle in terms of your ability to withstand a drawdown, perhaps at the very moment you start getting aggressive. The good news is that with the sheer amount of debt and stupidity in the system, I am fairly confident that risk off is going to come back in a much more aggressive way than most realize. The yeah. market has a very funny way of humbling the masses. The masses, I, I, I tell you, I see it all the time. There is so much unbelievable, uneducated speculation going on in this environment. I'm all for speculation. If it's educated, a lot of people are just going into the markets and they're not even learning and spending the 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell will argue is, is what you need to be an expert in something. They're just throwing money at the wall and suddenly they're geniuses. This, I think we, you know, the Fed has created an environment which is very, very um, dangerous because it's created reckless speculation, reckless leverage. And maybe that all in Bitcoin trade works until you get a margin call event like we saw not too long ago, where suddenly Bitcoin is down 20%. If you're long term, who cares? But the reality is most people are not long term. Yeah. Well, you know, Michael, most, you know, you and I have been around uh, since uh, for me, it's been since the 90s, since the mid 90s. And I've, I've, been, I've lived through the dot com bubble. And I'm sure you probably have as well. So do you see and do you feel the parallels between then and now? I, I think there are some similarities, but, but here's the, the caveat with all this stuff. I always make this point. Former Fed chair, Alan Greenspan, right? He coined the term irrational exuberance. Right? The markets were going up vertically. It's like, this is irrational. Right? Okay. He was right. But he said that in 1996. So my point in saying that is that, you know, it's very, I would go back to path matters more than prediction. The path of markets matters more than what you think will happen to markets, the way it gets to its end point. So it could unequivocally be like the late 90s as a bubble, but it could also last for a number of years still. Sure. Right? And this is the challenge in a world of tremendous short-termism and also a lot of people would justifiably have all the right reasons in the world to be bearish and keep trying to short into this and keep getting their ass handed to them. You have to be cognizant of the fact that nobody knows the future and the exact moment when something happens. That's why for me, the mindset's always around conditions. Yeah, that's true. And because uh, the, 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 uh, the edge is uh, double edged there, you know, it cuts both ways too. So, well, Michael, you know, it's, um, First of all, I'm I'm a big fan of your work and always always have been. Can you tell us a little bit about where where do I find your work and how do I track what you do? If I'm a trader, I'm at home and I'm just learning about you. Yeah, no, I appreciate. I mean, I I put a lot of stuff on Twitter. It's also on Instagram and Facebook and stock twits at Lead Lag Report and then leadlagreport.com. And you know, I, I do more than just the writings. Again, I'm a I'm a fiduciary. I'm running you know public funds, a mutual fund, and two ETFs. All right. Well, thank you very much for spending your time with us today, Michael. And I appreciate your time. And I look forward, maybe at the beginning of 2022, I'd like to get your take on how you're feeling about the start of the new year. Sounds good. I appreciate it, Blake. Happy holidays to you. Same to you. Hey, traders, Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also click the bell notification so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.